gracious Father in heaven. You've called us into your house this your holy Sabbath. And we have come claiming the blood of your Son, his life and death for us. We recognize that it's not only his sacrifice for us that is necessary, but also his life here on earth and his life now serving as our high priest, that our sins may not only be forgiven, but blotted out. Strengthen us, Lord, by your spirit, that we may daily be born again indeed, living the life walking by your spirit. Teach us, magnify thy name, that we may cooperate with you and that your character may be written in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Today we are continuing in our series with Daniel's prayer. We're going to be beginning a aspect of it that can be very much misunderstood. We need to be very proactively listening and not allowing outside influences to distract us. The prayer of Daniel in chapter 9 of Daniel we have seen as extremely important example for us today. We will begin today by a quotation from Sanctified Life. Daniel does not proclaim his own fidelity before the Lord. Instead of claiming to be pure and holy, this honored prophet humbly identifies himself with the really what? Sinful of Israel. Wow. No matter the knowledge or experience of walking by the Spirit, we must be able and willing to be as Daniel to identify ourselves with those who profess to be Seventh-day Adventists and are of the faith of Adventism. We must pray like Daniel for the sincere of heart to be converted and filled with the Holy Spirit with an unreserved heart for God. We have also begun to get the application of Daniel's prayer for us. And today we are now needing to further understand in today's context the seal of the living God. And with that as a context, note this admonition from the prophet of God. And from this quotation, we are know that it is directly relating to not Daniel 9, but Ezekiel 9. Not all who profess to keep the Sabbath will be sealed. There are many, even among those who teach the truth to others, who will not receive the seal of God in their foreheads. Notice, these professed people of God were not sealed in the forehead, but they had the truth. Physically possessing the truth or acknowledging the truth as the truth, but will never bring the seal of God in the forehead. You can have the truth, you can not acknowledge the truth, you can know the truth. But until it is assimilated into your life, it will never be written in the forehead. In other words, they were members of professed Adventism, but did not allow the truth to transform their lives by the assimilation of the present truth. 
continuing in the paragraph from Testimonies to Ministers, the Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5. This chapter is called The Seal of God. I've made up some booklets there with the bulletins. If you do not have it, they're on the in the foyer. Make sure that you get a copy. It's, it's directly from Volume 5 of the Testimonies. If you don't have the nine volume set, at least you'll have this chapter. Continuing the paragraph. They had the light of truth. They knew the Master's will. They understood every point of our faith, but they, what? Had not corresponding works. Those who were so familiar with prophecy and the treasures of divine wisdom should have acted their faith. Now I have a question like Peter. Peter said, well, if you got all that and you still are lost, what about those who don't even have it? They don't have a chance, do they? If you are professing Adventism and you don't even know, you have never even assimilated the present truth, you are in a very precarious situation. You see, Daniel walked with God. His faith in God kept his life in complete context, no matter how demanding the responsibilities in the royal throne room was. You see, Daniel was not just a nobody. In the Babylonian kingdom, he was second ruler of the world. And when the government changed hands and the Medo-Persians took hold, what position did he help? Second ruler of the kingdom. Have you ever contemplated the protection and the guidance that God gave to Daniel to not only be the second in command in Babylon, but when it came to meet a Persia, rule the world, he was also second in command again? I mean, how many times does the vice president change when the president is newly elected? <laughs> in other words, there's never been a vice president that stayed to be vice president and only the president changed. If the president changes, what else changes? The vice president changes. But not in this case. Interesting, huh? Daniel was in a high position. He was highly regarded. You see, we have no excuses to think that we cannot live for Jesus here in this year as it ends in 2015. Right. We need maybe to pray and to fast and plead for the strength as this new year that is coming is soon to be upon us. That we begin now to learn all, to also keep the court of heaven in view by faith. No matter what we're doing in our life's work. You know, some of us, we may look at some people and say, oh man, these people, they got it easy. They're retired. They don't have any responsibilities. Trust me, when you're retired, you've got more responsibilities than when you're working. I'll let you think about that for a while. Because the reality is that when you are not working a 9 to 5 job or 8 to 4 or 30 or whatever the case may be and you are have no responsibilities to serve in a employment capability You've got more responsibility before God than anyone else. Amen. Amen. So don't go around claiming, oh man, if I get retired, how much more I can do for God? Yes, that may be true, but if you're not doing it, <laughs> Just 
today we are looking, God is looking for those who are willing to be like a Daniel. Willing to acknowledge the sin of His people and confess the corporate sin and plead for the purging of all sin out of our lives. You see, there's corporate sin that we are guilty of because we profess to be Seventh-day Adventists. And we cannot just point a finger and say, they're doing it this way so bad. But we need to be willing to confess the corporate sin. Daniel did. We must also. But before we can even do this, we must understand the awfulness of sin. To hate sin as God our Father hates sin. To acknowledge daily we are sinners needing the, the blood of Jesus to cover us. His righteousness brought in us through the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is extremely important for us to understand. There is a we are living in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. And when you say the Holy Spirit isn't there, you're cutting yourself off from having Christ in you the hope of glory. The Review and Herald, March 2, 1897. The dispensation in which we are now living is to be to those that ask The dispensation of the Holy Spirit. Ask for His blessing. It is time we were more intense in our devotion. To us is committed the arduous but happy glorious work of revealing Christ to those who are in darkness. We are called to proclaim the special truths for which time? This time. This time. In 1897, it's more true even now in 2015. For all this, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is essential. We should pray for it. The Lord expects us to ask Him. We have not been wholehearted in this work. We need to be asking ourselves, are we wholeheartedly committed to being a present true Seventh-day Adventist today? All Heaven's Council is looking to see if we will unreservedly commit our lives to God's sovereign will. The work of the Holy Spirit in our lives brings the saving power of the new birth first in us. And then we are used to entreat others to Christ by that same power of the Holy Spirit. Yet, there is far too much comfort of God's people in this world. And this world is full of sin. We can point out others in the church, their sins and their problems, or at least our perception of the sin and their problems. But we hide our eyes to our own needs of purging like Dan, we will be lost. And if you haven't heard the first two sermons in this series, make sure you understand the first two deal with Dan, because <coughs> Dan is never saved. You cannot have the characteristics of Dan in your life and be going to heaven. They not only need to be forgiven, they need to be purged completely out of you. Notice, this is why now we consider why Daniel's prayer is linked with being sealed by God. Settling into the present truth, never to be moved or to stagger when facing the trials of life. Manuscript releases volume 18, 236. She starts out the paragraph, study the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. Now, if the prophet of God says, study the ninth chapter of Ezekiel, what are you going to do? You're going to what? Okay, that would be a good idea, right? But what kind of study is study mean? Now, as a professor, our soon-to-be elder will 
testify that there are some people who define study much different than others. But how does God define study? The 1828 Dictionary. To study, that is, to set the thought or mind. Literally, setting of the mind or thoughts on a subject. The attention, meditation. Now we can continue. It says to fix the mind closely. Okay, not only are we to, to meditate on it, but we are to fix the mind closely on the subject. Now I know that there are some students in Brother Foyer's college class that he would really wish that they would apply this definition. Because they don't dwell on the subject. They don't even fix their mind on the subject closely. But God's asking us individually to do it. And if you think a college professor wants you to fix your mind on a subject, when God says to fix your mind on a subject, how much more important is that? Oh, me. Oh, it's eternally more important to apply the mind, to endeavor diligently, to apply the mind, to examine the purpose of learning. We need to learn from the aspect of even why we're studying chapter 9. You see, it's one thing to study chapter 9 in Ezekiel. But we also should know why we are studying chapter 9 of Ezekiel. Does that make sense? Okay, very good. Continuing in the paragraph. Study the... Ninth chapter of Ezekiel. These words will be what? Literally. Literally fulfilled. Yet the time is passing and people are what? Asleep. So God is saying here, I want you to study something, but we're saying, oh, I don't have enough time. I think I'll just pass. Let's go back and it was part of our scripture reading. Let's go back and read Ezekiel 9, 3 and 4. And the glory of the Lord, of God of Israel was gone up from the chair. Whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man with the lit, clothed in the linen which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city. Through the midst of Jerusalem. See, first he said go through the city. Now, does it identify what city that is? No. No, he just said through the city. So then God reiterates again, and he identifies which city to go through. Jerusalem. Through the midst of Jerusalem. And to set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry, all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Now I'm going to take a two week break on this subject and then we come back in two weeks. We're going to be asking one question. Can you, ask, can you tell me what question that is? What are the abominations? Alright, well what are the abominations? We're not going to get to the abominations today. But next time we are going to be dealing with the abominations that because we got to know. Mm -hmm. Can you sigh and cry for something that you don't know about? No. No. In other words, it will be useless for us to even apply Ezekiel 9 into our lives if we have no clue of what abominations God is talking about. These two references connect everything we have considered so far. First, we must set our minds in the focus on this chapter of Ezekiel. And then secondly, apply it into our minds. Then when we reading verse 4, we find heaven defines clearly and distinctly who will receive God's mark. It says, set a mark Go to the next slide, please. Set a mark upon the foreheads 
of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations done in the midst thereof. God's mark has a condition. What is the condition? Sighing and crying. What's the next question after we acknowledge that the condition is to sigh and cry? What does God mean when He says sighing and crying? Man, we're not getting to the abominations yet. First, what does God mean when He says we are to sigh and to cry? Again, the Webster's Dictionary. To lament. To mourn. Testimonies to Ministers, Volume 5, page 212. The day of God's judgment is just upon us. The seal of God will be placed upon the foreheads of those only who sigh and cry for the abominations done in the land. Here is the reminder of Daniel's prayer and the prayer we must be willing to pray. Remember, the life of Daniel is an inspired illustration of true sanctification. We will never become settled into present truth without the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit daily strengthening us in our walk in Christ. Living in this world of sin will bring us to serious prayer before God's throne. Just as Daniel prayed, we must be inspired also to pray. It is at this point I am extremely fearful as a pastor. For in going into this subject, endeavoring to bring out the seriousness of this topic, of what God wants every human being who is desiring salvation from sin, what God expects. You see, the vast majority is self-deceived into thinking themselves a Christian when they are just baptized pagans professing to be that which they know not of. And you can be just as much a baptized pagan sitting here today as if you went to church on Sunday or any other church on Sabbath. It doesn't matter where you're going to church if you have not assimilated the present truth into your life. It's just geography. We need to remember God's not looking for profession. By itself. You see, far too many, even in the ranks of Seventh day Adventists who profess present truth, think that their knowledge of the theory of present truth will save them from sin. It won't. You can memorize every book that is published by this church and still be lost. Because if you don't have the Spirit of God that inspired the men to write the books, the words are nothing. You can, you can get the knowledge of present truth so clear in your mind, you can debate anybody and win and still be lost. The biggest problem Seventh-day Adventist pioneers had was they had it here, but they had not Christ. And that is the reason why the 1888 message was the last message of truth given to the people of God. Because they had everything else settled pretty much settled in their doctrine. But they didn't have the author of the doctrine.
See, when you start having the author in you, the hope of glory, then all the doctrine and everything fits and it's not tempered mortar any longer. It's solid. Amen. But in reality, from God's point of view, the majority are lacking many things that make a person, any person, a true Christian. You see, the careless way spiritual things are held in our lives makes us a baptized pagan. <laughs> the lack of priority and the necessity of spiritual responsibility makes us baptized pagans. The lack of reverence in God's house, even in our daily lives, all is taking God's name in vain and makes us baptized pagans. Mm. And such God will not forgive these abominations and greater ones done in all in the name of God. Ezekiel brings us face to face with these five destroying angels coming from God's throne, only one with a writer's ink horn to place the mark of God. It's not that God would prefer that all have the writer's ink horn. But there are so few who have cooperated with heaven's plan of salvation. The majority have man's opinions for their theology. Trusted in the flesh of today's theology when God has given us so much counsel from His Word. Those who are willing to be truly converted and confess past errors and are also be zealous in the works of repentance will find reformation and transformation God has promised to do in us and finish it in us. Yet we are, are we really willing to actually cooperate having the mind of Jesus? fully surrendered, unreservedly surrendered to our Father's will? Or do we just profess it? Continuing in our quotation from manuscript releases, they refuse to humble their souls and be converted. There is so much that can be said here. I, I'm not going to go into it for the lack of time, but the reality is this. When God's prophet tells you how you are to learn present truth and you say no, you are showing yourself as being unconverted. And when you stand in front of people, leadership of organizations, who refuse to understand present truth as God has laid it out, thinking their taught theology, their understood theology is good enough to be converted, you are converted but not in Christ. And now the blood of thousands, yes, millions are on your head because of that leadership position. Continuing, not a great while longer will the Lord bear with the people who have, had, who have such great and important truths revealed to them, but who refuse to bring it into their individual experience. The time is short and God is calling. Will you hear? Will you receive His message? Will you be converted before it's too late? Soon, very soon, every case will be decided for eternity. This was written in 1909. This is serious.
This is a hundred and almost 107 years ago that it was written. Like I said earlier, last week, as a people, we went back into the wilderness three times since this was written. We need to understand. Both the sealing and the destroying will be literally fulfilled. Being written in 1909, yet God has waited. And I'm telling you what, if anyone says God is not patient, this in itself is an example of God being patient. Amen. It is gravely nigh gone now. Time is gone. We cannot dabble around with passiveness about our conversion and present truth. We cannot think, oh, I'll study this or that when I get more time. You don't have more time. And you will never get more time. Mm. We've got to be asking God to help us prior, make our time adjusted so that we have our priorities straightened out. And say, Lord, what do you want me to get out so I can put in what you want me to put in? Amen. Amen. We need to be our lives reorganized. It's the end of the year. As we are coming into the new year, let us take these last two weeks of this year and just start focusing, okay, Lord, how do you want me to rearrange my life that it's on your agenda and not earth's agenda? It doesn't mean you're going to go between now and two weeks from now, you're going to quit your job. That's not what I'm saying. No. But if heaven tells you that's what you got to do, then do it. Sometimes we need to be willing to live in a, in a one-bedroom one cabin than a five-bedroom house. Some of us have come from a one-bedroom cabin. And we love our four-bedroom house or our three-bedroom house. And we don't want to go back to the one-bedroom cabin. Testimonies to the church, volume 5, 212. The day of God's vengeance is upon us. The seal of God will be placed upon those foreheads of those only who sigh and cry for the abominations done in the land. Therefore, to sigh and cry for the abominations, we must first know what it is God is calling as abominations. We can be like those of Dan and be quick to judge and cause the innocent to be lost in our own soul also. Going into this part of the theology of, of Daniel's prayer and us today, the sealing of God, lifting up the sin that's so easily seen We need to be also praying that, Lord, we do not harm the innocent. Because there are a lot of people who don't understand what they're doing is wrong. Because they're trusting in an organization. This is very serious. People are at the brink of making decisions and a wrong word said or done with good intentions can damn people into eternal hell. Oh God. Eternal destruction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or we can be like Daniel and like Jesus with hearts of love. Compassion. 
pleading for those in error. Not from a judgmental, pious mindset, but from the mindset of Christ. You see, there, there's a time when you be like Christ and say, you viper in the grass. <laughs> and I have done it right to their face. But you better make sure it's from the Holy Spirit and not from your own passion of self-exaltation. Because then you're like, damn. Mm -hmm. I, I, I had a minister, he, this was almost 30 years ago, 25 years ago, he came and he preached a sermon at our church, and I purposely made sure I was the last one out of the sanctuary. Because I knew everybody would be heading straight to the fellowship room and I would have him alone. <laughs> and I said, Brother, I really enjoyed your sermon, but I would like you to define one thing. When is the end of time? You said the church would go through to the end. When is the end? Because everybody here listening to you interpreted it as being when Christ returns. And if you're standing up there teaching that the Seventh-day Adventist organization is going to exist until and teaching the truth until Jesus comes, I got a problem with it. So when's the end? He says, well, that's, that's what the close of probation. I says, oh, really? Nobody here believes that. What you said was that. You didn't say that. You said till the end and Jesus comes. You left out a whole lot of room. What about the plagues? Oh, well, we don't talk about that. I'm sorry. You're dumb dog. It's amazing why he didn't like me. <laughs> I get it. Man. Whether you're a preacher or a layman, if you know the truth, don't be a dumb dog. But make sure you know when to speak straight Clearly and distinctly, and when you need to love, bring it with love in a way that will win somebody. <clears throat> I told the minister, I said, Brother, you need to preach it so that people will know exactly what you mean and mean what you say, and don't gray it around. He said, Maybe you're right. I said, I know I'm right. I said, I know these people and I know exactly what they interpreted what you said. And if that's not what you meant, you need to clear it up. It is imperative we obtain the right kind of experience. Not sometime, but right now. To have spiritual discernment cannot be given to the unconverted. If you're going to have spiritual discernment and be sealed by God, you will have to first be converted to be born again, led by the Spirit. Testimonies to Ministers, Testimonies to Church, Volume 3, 324. According to the light God has given me in vision. Now, Ellen White is stating a lot right there in those few words. When Ellen White is in vision, is she breathing? No. 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 Does she have any ability physically of her own? No. 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 What strength is she sustained on? God's strength. God's strength. The Holy Spirit. And only the Holy Spirit. 
So according to the Holy Spirit, that whole sentence could read, according to the Holy Spirit, wickedness and deception are increasing among God's people who profess to keep His commandments. Now who is that talking about? Seventh day Adventist. So now we can read, go back and read it again. According to the Holy Spirit, wickedness and deception are increasing among Seventh day Adventists, professed Seventh day Adventists. Spiritual discernment to see sin as it exists and then to put it out of the camp is decreasing among. Seventh-day Adventists. And spiritual blindness is coming upon them. Now let's, let's get it correct. This is what God is saying. This is what the Holy Spirit is saying. Continuing. The straight testimony must be revived and will separate those from Israel who have ever been at war with the means that God has ordained to keep the corruptions out of the church. Wrongs must be called wrongs. Grievous sins must be called by their right name. And when you do this in the mainline church, you will be thrown out of the apostate church. Yes. Absolutely. And I don't care if you're a layman or a minister. You will not be able to stay in a mainline church if you speak the straight testimony. They will throw you out. All of God's people should come nearer to Him and to wash their robes of the character of character in the blood of the Lamb. Then will they see sin in the true light and realize how offensive it is in the sight of God. Amen. It is impossible. What did I say? Impossible. It is impossible to understand the true character of sin unless you are daily washed and covered in the blood of Christ. Amen. Do not think for a moment you are safe without the blood. Parents. Now we're all parents, most of us. Our children are not safe. And personal direct instruction must be given and repeated until every child in the home understands God's will for their little lives. Don't think instructing your children one time is good enough. Why do you think in this church I'm on my third time around on dealing with the seal of God's people? Because you haven't gotten it yet. That's right. I've just reworked the sermons. There's only one person in this congregation that's come to me and said, Pastor, the sermons in this series are very similar to the first set you did. I said, yeah. And guess what? The third set's going to be the same way. We're going to have different titles coming from a different perspective, but it's still the same subjects. Because we've got to get it settled into our minds and it's not going to be settled doing it one time. Amen. Amen. Or two times. Amen. And for a child, sometimes even under the age of seven, has to hear it about a dozen times and then sometimes they don't get it then. 
Because sometimes as parents, we aren't giving it the way God wants it given. And the little child is going, huh? I don't understand, Daddy. All the other kids are doing it, Mommy. Why can't we? See, sometimes as parents, we're given mixed messages. And we give mixed messages as parents, the children are so confused, they don't know what to do. Because they don't know what to do, they do what they think is best. And it's what they enjoy. Because they're born in sin. And shaped in iniquity. That's right. First, we as parents must have the right experience. Sabbath School Worker. This is a publication. Very little known. The angel with the writer's ink horn by his side will not put the seal of God upon any child. That should really bring you up here now. Mm -hmm. Who is irreverent? irreverent disobedient. Disobedient. Mm -hmm. And dishonors if his parents mm -hmm. or her parents. Children, I'm speaking to you right now. Do not dishonor your parent in any way. If you want to be in heaven. Amen. And as parents, when your child dishonors you, disrespects you, is irreverent in the home or in the church, they must be corrected. The destroying angel is commissioned to slay utterly. Now, when it says utterly, how much is that? Completely. In other words, that's without exception, without mercy. And then, the Holy Spirit says, old and young, both men, women, and even little children, babies. If the children are insubordinate and disobedient to their parents, they will be the same to who? God. To God. Amen. This is extremely important. That we understand what God is saying. We need to be ready to accept whether we are parents or children, that our actions of disrespect, of disobedience, of irreverence will not be excused by God. In Ezekiel 9, God has clearly revealed the utter destruction of those who are in rebellion against God's authority. It is not an easy road to proclaim belief and in, in and the intention of the assimilation of present truth in our lives and in our homes. Now I'm going to get real personal here. Every church has its grapevine. And it's in this church too. And I'm getting tired of it. Yeah, I got your attention. When we, this church family, is in this community, and where there are 1,600 Seventh-day Adventists in this town, When you are speaking to them and you they know where you go to church and they disrespect 
me as the pastor of this church as the reason why they will not come here. You need to be very clear with them. They're not rejecting me. They're rejecting God. Amen. That's true. Amen. <clears throat> and if you are not clear with these individuals who are disrespecting this pastor and the office that I hold, and you have not asked them, have you spoken personally to Pastor Mills? Their blood is on your head and on your head. And you're lost. We need to learn how to cut the grapevine. Mm -hmm. That is wild grapes. That's right. Or is it because you are so afraid of friendships that you are not willing to stand up for truth? Because you will be persecuted when you stand for truth. That's right. I know it got real quiet. But I'm telling you something. I strive day by day by day and many nights to make sure that I never give my opinion in this desk. Because we're far too long spent to have opinions. Oh, Christ. Mm. The watered-down theology that is put in the churches today will not bring you into the gates of heaven, but into the gates of hell. That's true. And friendships will put you there with them. That's right. So what is it going to be? Early writings, page 67. I saw that those who of late have embraced the truth would have to know what it is to suffer for Christ's sake. That they would have trials to pass through that would be keen and cutting in order that they may be purified and fitted through suffering to receive the seal of God. To pass through the time of trouble. To see the King in His beauty. To dwell in the presence of God and appear in holy angels. Don't sidestep this. Satan's agents in professed Adventism will be the first to heap personal attacks against anyone standing for the truth. Sure. Some of the most effective agents of Satan are those who ride the line between right in the middle as close as they can. Showing the unbeliever of present truth and an uncommitted life. In this Christmas time season, nobody sitting in this sanctuary should be participating in paganism. Amen. Sure. These pagan programs that are going on by, quote, Seventh-day Adventists should be thrown out. Praise the Lord. And participating in it, you are approving it. Yes. We need to stand up for what's right. Manuscript Releases, Volume 14, page 163. There is a marked contrast between those who bear the seal of God and those who worship the beast in His image. And when God does not put His seal on your forehead, you have the mark of the beast whether you think you have it or not. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. Mm. 
one or the other. You can be keeping the Sabbath all your days and receive the mark of the beast. Because if you don't have the mark of God, you have the mark of the beast. That is right. And keeping the Sabbath does not guarantee you to have the mark of God. That's right. The faithful, the Lord's faithful servants will receive the bitterest of persecution from false teachers who will not hear the word of the Lord. Word of God. And who prepare stumbling blocks to prepare to be put up in the way of those who would, would hear. There are those going to the mainline churches here in Port St. Lucie who if they stood up and took their stand for truth, this church would have to find a new location. True. Amen. But because those who recognize that present truth is here and will not come, the ones who really would hear, says, well, it must not really matter. Compromise is the road to hell. That's true. God, but God's people are not to fear. Amen. Satan cannot go beyond his limit. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus. There are many who not only reject present truth, but they put barriers in the way that others cannot hear. And when we see and know this work going on, how much energy do we do to remove those barriers? Are we going to be like Gideon and tear down the altar? To tear down the barriers? To, to tear down the influences against present truth? Or are we just going to compromise? Oh, we can be still be friends. It doesn't matter. You can go to that church. It's okay. No, it isn't okay. That's right. Within the next three months, you're going to understand what I'm saying to you right now. The abominations that God refers to in Ezekiel 9 have been completely fulfilled in the mainline Seventh-day Adventist church. All that is waiting is for the destroying angel to come. It's all but too late. And as we compromise our friendships and say, well, this is where we choose to go. And leave it at that. Allowing them to think it's okay to be over there. And still get to heaven. You haven't heard anything that's been said. But I'm going to lay it out so clear that if you don't understand it, there's nothing more I can do. The Holy Spirit cannot reach you. You can attend here all you want. I'm never going to tell you not to come. But you're not listening by the Holy Spirit. Satan wants present truth and those who teach it to preach and live and still be destroyed. But praise God, He has limits. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. We must be ever vigilant by the power of God to maintain a marked contrast between our lives and those who reject God's truth. Right. God declares in Jeremiah 10 2, Learn not the way of the heathen. Now guess what? This learn is not the kind of learn that you might think it is. The original language for learn is lama. The primary root is to gourd, that is, to teach. Yes, I didn't know this until this week. It is very interesting because how you teach an animal 
is you guard it, you poke it. When you want a horse to go a direction, you kick it in the flanks, you yank on the chain on the bridle. You're teaching it what to do. When you teach a dog how to, to do its tricks and stuff, you have a mechanism to make sure it minds and understands that if you do this, you get reward. If you don't, you get another reward. That's true. Learn not the ways of the heathen. Now learn the way. What does the word way mean? Sure. Figuratively, a course of life or a mode of action. Uh, it makes it, we need to understand what this means. This week I had a gentleman come up to me. He knows I'm a minister and he knows that I stand for truth. So he asked me, he says, how do you deal with this uh, holiday situation, holiday time of life? I says, well, I make sure everybody knows that I do not celebrate the pagan holidays. And we were talking about a few things and he says, hey, by the way, he said, this uh, charismatic, charismatic, Charisma. That's a root from Christ, right? <laughs> I says, no, actually it's just the opposite. So I went into that to help them understand that charisma is actually from a, his, hip, a hypnotic trait that is occultic and it's not from Christ at all. Christ spoke as no man spake because of the purity of his voice and it wasn't because he was enticing them. He says, wow, i never heard of that before. I says, you want me to get you the proof on it? He says, no, no, I trust what you're saying. I said, then by the way, did you know that in the Bible is recorded Christmas celebration over 1,500 years before Christ was born? He says, no, I didn't know the Bible had anything to say about Christmas. I said, yes, it does. And so I had Bible on my phone, and so I opened it up, and I says, here. Went Jeremiah 10 and started reading it to him. He goes, whoa. <laughs> I never knew. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you see, people have got to know who you are and why you believe what you believe. Yeah. It's not my opinion. When God says, learn not the way of the heathen, He yeah. meant learn not the way of the heathen. Amen. Mm. And when you go among the heathen, make sure that you're trying to pull them out of the heathenism. That's right. Therefore, we must be vigilant in how we live our lives that nothing... We must be ever careful in how we never accept the knowledge of this lost world and how we live. We must never do or say or be perceived as supporting the worldly ways of the lost. We must trust God's promise to the wicked. You know God promised? He promised to the faithful. He also promised to the wicked. It's interesting. The last quote of Ellen White, she closed this last paragraph that I just quoted with this quote from Jeremiah. 25. Therefore prophesy thou against them. You see, we're supposed to prophesy again. Remember that Revelation 10, 11? Mm -hmm. The close of probation comes with a prophecy. Either receiving the seal of God or you will receive something else from God. Don't be mixing words. Don't be sugarcoating it. God doesn't. If you don't believe me, let's read it together. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high and utter His voice from His holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon His habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. God's judgments will be poured out without mercy. And when that time comes, the whole world will suffer without exception. The only exception that God even gives ability for are those who are sealed by Him, Amen. who have His mark under the blood of Jesus. Not a profession, but a reality. Just like the angel of death 
passed over the houses where the blood was applied in Egypt, so shall the plagues not be felt where the blood is applied to the heart of the true Christian. Verse 31, And noise shall e come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Verse 32, Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from the nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. And the slain of the Lord shall be that at that day from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. Now he's talking a whole lot of death. Yes, he is. They shall not be a lament, that we shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be as dumb on the ground. Now this is talking about when Christ returns. Definitely. If you're not ready for his second coming, you're going to be like dumb on the earth. And there'll be nobody to cry over you being dead. Mercy, mercy, Lord. This world is going to stink mm. just as bad as sin stinks. Yes. Amen. If you've ever been around a rotting corpse of one animal, think about what seven billion people rotting on this earth is going to smell like. You see, there are only two lifestyles that we can have. One is the destruction and the other to eternal life. Life eternal begins with a daily, unreserved, surrendered life powered by the Holy Spirit. Bringing the very life of Jesus in us, the hope of glory. Is your life surrendered? Are you living a life of compromise or a life solely for Christ? Let us contemplate. Let us meditate and ask the Lord to reveal to us individually where we stand before His throne. And may we stand in Christ. Amen. 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 Loving, merciful, and gracious Father in heaven. As a people, we have sinned greatly. Time was short in 1909, and here it is now, the end of 2015. You've told us that it's because of the insubordination of your people against your throne that we have, we have caused the delay of your return. How long, Lord, will you be long-suffering to us? Help us, Lord, as a people to be willing to take authority from your throne and your throne alone. That every moment of our lives will be authored by the power of your throne and not from man. Magnify yourself, Lord, and by your Spirit, as we surrender to you, purge out everything your name may be glorified, we pray. Amen.